today, Guy Watson from Riverford, who's going to give us a talk about Riverford and answer some of our questions afterwards. So welcome, Guy. It's really nice of you to be here with us. And uh, please give us your story. Okay, well, uh, hi, everyone. And, and thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to, to speak. Uh, I'm not very good on the technology, and I did try and put a presentation together and failed. So uh, Jenny, has, who's more technically proficient than me, has done it and is controlling the slides. So uh, I'm just going to give you, I think, uh, I haven't seen the slides, I'm afraid, but a bit of a history of Riverford, and but with particular reference to sustainability, maybe half an hour, and then and then we'll go into questions. So, you know, we are known, Riverford, principally for um, um, packing and growing, packing, delivering um, boxes, weekly boxes of vegetables, the veg box scheme. Uh, we will do about 90,000 this week, and it's grown from 30 years ago being just me to you know, employing a thousand people. And yeah, packing one of these boxes every, um, every, every couple of seconds, I think. So um, I always say that Riverford started really on my parents' wedding day, 1951. My dad was a recently demobbed, fallen aristocracy I suppose and um, no bloody use for anything really and so decided he was going to be a farmer my mum was much more practical and also wanted to be a farmer um, more chauvinistic times uh, she ended up being a mother and and, uh, and you know keeping the house largely but she was also involved in the farm it was formed by this marriage of a you know passionate but innovative farmer and 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 a cook so that that kind of combination of farming, not always in the way that everybody else is, and, and cooking is, I think, really what Riverford's uh, all about. So next slide, please. Um, so I did leave the farm, having grown up and always wanted to be a farmer. I argued with my family in my early 20s and left, and I took myself off to London and New York, became a management consultant. Didn't last very long. I hated it. Um, and came back to the farm in 1986 and started growing uh, vegetables on a very small scale. It really was a, a, a wheelbarrow and a borrowed tractor. And then the next slide is uh, me delivering. You know, I had an old two CV <laughs> that I used to drive around the shops delivering, and it was a very small business. So, um, so the next slide is um, this is you know really more like us today. Um, you know, we're out. Devon is a you know rolling countryside, not particularly fertile land, very steep doesn't really lend itself to the sort of mechanisation that um, most of the uh, UK and indeed world veg industry has gone through. So we are very still very dependent on relatively small teams of, um, of people out there working, you know, very physically demanding jobs. Um, and uh, I suppose that's part of the reason. I think I always felt and probably inherited from my father that business is really all about people. And, and motivating those people, often under pretty adverse circumstances, is often the, the key to success. So, you know, just file that away. People are, you know, very important to us at Riverford. The so next slide. Um, we uh, first, I suppose it was 15 years ago when we did our first carbon footprint. So we were really well ahead of most people in that sense. We did it with working with ex University. We did it again last year. And um, it really turns out that the transport, I said these, this, it's always when you talk about carbon footprints, important to say what it is that you're measuring. We are measuring everything from pretty much the field gate, transport to us, packaging, and then transport back out again to the customer and final delivery to the customer. We're measuring the commuting of our business travel, but also people coming to work. We, it's, it's what they call scope one, two, and three emissions. It's the most extensive um, definition of a carbon footprint. But the one thing this doesn't include is the, what actually happens on the land the land that we don't actually farm ourselves, so the suppliers to us. And transport is by far the biggest part of the common. We are principally vegetable growers, so please bear in mind that this is for vegetables. If you were looking at dairy or meat or eggs, it would be a very different um, diagram, and transport would be a much smaller part of it, and the emissions associated with actually producing the produce would be much higher. Um, 
Um, and you can see that farming is pretty tiny. It's only 4%. Well, we're buying in a lot of the vegetables from other people, so perhaps that's not surprising. Packaging is quite substantial. Um, anyway, next slide. Um, so what can we do to uh, reduce our emissions? Um, next slide, Jenny. Um, uh, we are going to um, electrify our entire, well, one day it'll be our entire delivery fleet. Um, I, I think we've committed to it being 70% by 2023. Um, and by the time 2030, we're planning that everything will be electric, including all our HGVs, which is quite a, you know, I have to say the technology does not exist for that less. Um, but I, we will also be, um, we're looking at what are the most impactful things that we import. So currently the worst thing we import are for a couple of months a year, uh, typically uh, June, July, we import apples from New Zealand, in fact, actually from a friend of mine who grows organic apples in New Zealand. They have a carbon footprint of 800 grams of CO2 per kilo of apples. It's completely unacceptable. Uh, this will be the last year that we do it. Um, we have already, just, you know, we don't sell anything air freighted. We don't sell anything grown in heated glass. We're going to kind of work our way down um, the kind of hierarchy of madnesses um, and, and, and get back to, um, you know, a lower uh, sourcing of lower carbon intensity um, products. Next slide, please. Um, so less packaging. Um, I think I won't talk too much about this. We have gone in entirely to compostable plant-based plastics for our um, vegetables. Um, and we have gone through a massive reduction in packaging. I mean, I think we're roughly, actually I think it's rather less than a quarter of the amount of packaging and a quarter of the amount of plastic that a supermarket would use per kilo of vegetables. So we're already good, but we're not by any means good enough. Next slide. Uh, and a whole load of stuff we're going through. I mean, this is all, the thing about actually a lot of carbon reduction stuff, it is really boring, <laughs> but you know, the boring details really matter. So, you know, making sure you don't have leaks of your refrigeration gas, that, that used to be Tesco's, it used to be 25% of their carbon footprint, you know, pretty staggeringly. Um, uh, and uh, it's much, much less for us, but you know, changing to LED lighting, um, you know, better optimization of electrical equipment. We've already put up the largest um, solar installation, private solar installation. In, in the southwest on rooftops and we'll be putting up more of that possibly anaerobic digestion and probably a windmill as well obviously the big challenge with electricity is to make sure that you're generating it at the same time that you want to use it unless you have a lot a lot of batteries and then i mean generally people would agree that if you're trying to get to um carbon zero our government's pledging to do it by 2050 which is woefully late I think really, if we have any chance of staying within our one and a half degrees of warming, we need to be at climate, com, uh, carbon zero by about 2030. So this is our plan to do it. Our various, always your first strategy should be to reduce your impacts by traveling less, being more efficient in what you do. Um, and we can see how we can reduce our, our carbon output by about 50%, actually that's being a bit, 40% anyway, which leaves another 50 or 60%, which you have to address by other means. Um, and in our case, that will be various sort of offsetting or actually, I think the term should probably should be onsetting. So we will, you know, we might plant trees which will absorb that amount of carbon and there could be lots of arguments about how much carbon a tree absorbs and when. So we will be doing various things, maybe how we manage our hedgerows, um, or it may even be um, that we will put up solar panels and, 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 that, and offset um, using electricity that other people will use. But the, um, you know, it is even for us as farmers with land to plant trees, it is, it is going to be really very challenging. It's definitely doable in terms of what will it cost um, we, you know, we're just in the early stage of really costing our plans, but 
you know, somewhere between one and 2% of sales, I think will probably do it. Um, and, uh, and that is actually consistent with our other estimates. So, so, you know, surely saving our planet, saving the future of our children. I mean, you know, how can anyone dispute that it's worth one or 2%? We do know, actually know how to save the planet and address climate change. We just don't seem to have the political and business will to organize ourselves to do it, which, you know, is to my mind just, you know, absolutely moronic, but, you know, just totally tragic as well. Um, next slide. Um, sorry, we'll just go on to the next one. I don't, I don't um, uh, so we do work, um, Extend, you know, with uh, growers around the world, these are pineapple growers in Togo, so where all our pineapples come from, we buy from a fair trade organic cooperative. Um, and, and the idea is to, I'm trying to make sure, you know, if you're going to import fruit, it's going to have, and most of the fruit in this country is imported, you know, it's going to have a very significant carbon footprint. It's going to be detrimental. And I just sort of feel if we're going to do that, we should at least make sure that as much of the benefit as possible goes back to the very small scale farmers who are producing these pineapples. I mean, typically they get about 12 pence for a pineapple. I mean, even the box costs more. I mean, it's absolutely... And, and, but believe it or not, that is getting on for twice what they would uh, be getting if they were non-fair trade, non-organic um, producers. Um, so that our policy is to um, import as little as we can to do it sanely, which mainly means not through um, uh, using any air travel, trying to do as much as possible by sea, uh, and then to make sure that as much of the benefit of that carbon cost goes back to uh, the producers as possible. So the next slide. Uh, we have worked for, um, oh, I think it was about 20 years I first went to Uganda. We worked with a charity, Send the Cow, to try and support sustainable farming in, in Uganda. I think it's an absolutely um, fantastic uh, charity that um, really helps doesn't give handouts, it gives hand up, so that, that i.e. that it really helps farming communities, largely women, to adopt better, more sustainable uh, farming practices. And, um, I, you know, I find it tremendously inspiring going there. And I suppose I, the reason I went there the first time, actually, was because so many people had said to me, well, organic food's all very well for, you know, rich middle class white people, but it's not going to feed the world. Um, to which my response was, well, conventional farming is not doing a very good job of feeding the world either. Um, however, I felt I should um, go and, and see for myself where, where, you know, food production really does count. So I went to sub-Saharan Africa and spent a couple of months visiting uh, farmers and, and seeing for myself. And I can, I can tell you that, you know, whether you call it organic or not, doesn't matter, sustainable, diverse, agriculture relying more heavily on mixtures of plants more heavily on perennial plants with less cultivation of the soil less use of imported fertilizers seeds pesticides the sort of techniques more composting better moisture conservation better ground cover all those things which are the techniques which are uh, send the cow trains people in you know were they to be adopted uganda could feed itself many times over i mean there is you know, very serious, um, you know, food shortages in the north of Uganda going into Sudan. When I was last there, there were anyway, and likewise in northern Kenya. You know, this really does matter. And, and, and you know, with better practices, um, certainly with more equitable land distribution, uh, with more empowerment of women, uh, then there's absolutely no question that we can feed ourselves. The reason people go hungry in our world are largely to do with unfair distribution of war of, of, of land, um, disruption associated with war a lot. In northern, northern Uganda, there had been a war for 20 years and many people had been displaced from the farm and were living in camps and had lost um, the knowledge of how to um, farm well. 
um, you know, it has very, we can, we can feed ourselves, we know how to feed ourselves and we can do that sustainably, you know, on a global scale. We may have to eat less animal products. Well, I would say we almost certainly will have to. We know the answers. I mean, the tragedy is that we just do seem to be incapable of implementing them. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions on that. So I'll go on to the next slide. Um, employee ownership. Riverford is um, uh, became employee owned uh, in June 2018. Um, and it stemmed from 15 years, I suppose, of thinking about ownership and fairness and capitalism and business and innovation and risk and, and, re and really concluding that conventional business was just failing in so many ways and, and becoming frustrated its biggest failing is that I, I didn't think it was getting the most out of the people who worked within it. I thought there had to be a better system where people could you know, have more autonomy over their own work and, and share in the profits um, and the benefits of success. And that eventually led to us becoming employee owned was it, two and a bit years ago. The then staff, now co-owners, own 74% of the business and share in the profits and, uh, and, and share in the decision making. I mean, they not only do they share in the profits, they do have a very real control over the direction that the business is, is going. And we are doing very well. And I'm sure the reason we're doing very well is quite largely because, well, one of them good major reasons is being employee owned so this idea that you know that I was standing on all their shoulders and benefiting from from their hard work has made me uncomfortable I think since the beginning in the same way I think it made my father uncomfortable actually and uh, anyway I, I guess I just wanted to demonstrate that a, a fairer way of um, running a business was possible and and could be um, successful and I do actually believe fundamentally that some degree of fairness and more equitable distribution of income is absolutely intrinsic to living sustainably I mean until we get the idea you know live by the philosophy that we share this planet with seven billion other people and uh, you know countless life forms I rather than wanting to own little bits of it for ourselves own as much as possible in many cases for ourselves I, I'm afraid as a species I think we're doomed I, d I don't see how we can live sustainably fundamentally with that philosophy so that's largely what led to us becoming employee owned and the next slide which I think not quite the last one so this was uh, that day in June 2018 and uh, uh, actually sitting at the front is, is my dad in the wheelchair he died um, six months later but I'm uh, anyway I'm very glad and proud that he um lived to see uh, Riverford becoming employee owned and he was very supportive of the idea. So next one. Yeah, I do feel that, um, yeah, people, I think it's obvious, you know, we look after what we feel, what close to us, we look after that best. So I feel feeling a, a sort of love and ownership of the countryside and, uh, you know, will inspire us to look after it. I think it's self-evident and I think that's the last one. So thank you. And um, I'm hoping there are gonna be lots of questions. 20 minutes. <laughs> well, thank you, Guy. That was very, very interesting. Really interesting. And um, it's a very nice business model you have. I think that adds to it and I think the values generally not just the sustainability mm. and organic aspects but you know the whole the whole business model all the ethics that go into it uh, I think make Riverford a really you know good organization or company whatever term you want to use so we've got various questions mm. you've touched on some of them already but I will give them to you anyway because you know there yeah. may be much more that you want to say and I'll do it in the order of which they seem to be most commonly asked. Okay. So the first one is, how can we feed the world in a sustainable way in view of climate change and an ever-growing population? And is organic farming a realistic alternative to industrial agriculture in terms of producing sufficient quantity for everyone? 
Okay. Um, there's quite a lot in that one, isn't there? You, you'll have to remind me at the end if I haven't answered <laughs> all of it. Um, so in terms of feeding ourselves sustainably, uh, I, do, I think people will argue till the cows go home about whether grazing livestock can be a net positive for the environment. Uh, I think there may be some circumstances where they can be, but I don't think there are any circumstances where uh, monogastric consumers of uh, grain and soya, um, and I, so I'm talking here about chickens and pigs largely, uh, that, you know, that we, we just cannot continue to eat them on, you know, on the scale that the West um, particularly the US, Australia, and you know, to a lesser extent, us uh, are consuming them. It's just not sustainable anyway. There's not enough land to go around to grow the food to then feed to an animal that, which will inefficiently convert it into food, uh, uh, food for us. I mean, it, it, we just can't do it. And, and we certainly can't do it if we hope to leave any spaces for nature left. So, you know, it is terrifying that the you know the Chinese you know developing countries, China and India, are starting to adopt a Western diet, and you know with all the diabetes and all the health problems that go with that as well. So, um, you know, we somehow we have to curb our appetites for meat and eggs and dairy, and that absolutely has to be a key part. There is a whole argument about grazing livestock, ruminants, sheep cows, goats and whatever, you know, they can deliver some environmental benefits and people argue about this a lot, particularly in, in, in uh, organic uh, circles. I'm not a vegetarian myself, I come from a, a dairy farming family, all my neighbours are, are livestock farmers, uh, sheep and beef largely, some dairy, and, and, and we use animal manure to, in, as part of our rotation, so it would perhaps be hypocritical of me to say that we should all become uh, vegans. I actually don't think I know how to farm without animals, but um, not on our land anyway, which isn't very fertile, but we are putting quite a lot of research and effort into making compost and, um, you know, reusing and, and let, cultivating the ground less and growing more perennial plants in an attempt to move away from what is basically an, an unsustainable form of agriculture. Uh, so I do think that that was the, the how the, um, is it, is it re I think part of it was can we reasonably feed ourselves? Yes, uh, organically? can we produce enough yeah. quantity yeah. if we don't yeah. use industrial yeah. methods? Well, um, I would say yes. I mean, you probably expect me to say that. I mean, I, and I base that we would struggle in this country again, given the patterns of consumption that we have, but. You know, we're a rich, overfed nation anyway. I mean, far more people suffer health problems from overconsumption than underconsumption. So perhaps, you know, perhaps there'd be a public health <laughs> argument for actually producing less, certainly yeah. less of certain animal products. So, um, but if, when I have my trips to, to Africa and elsewhere in the world actually uh, leave me in no doubt that we can feed ourselves sustainably you know, whether you call it organic or permaculture or whether it's agroecology, but we can, using a, a more sustainable and more ecological approach to farming, that we can produce the food that we need. Uh, I have no doubt at all, but it will probably will not follow the, you know, industrial farming model that we have. I mean, it will be much, much more complex. I mean, you know, the, some of the best farmers, I saw some of the worst agriculture I've seen in Uganda and some of the very best and the best farmers, um, you know, were... I, I did a little calculation on one guy's farm. He, he had two acres. Uh, he fed two families off it and, and um, he produced timber, fruit, coffee, cocoa. He had two cows, loads of pigs, chickens. And, and the, the land next door, which was in a monoculture and was being grazed, had one cow per five acres, you know. So, you know, he, I think I worked out it was tw his land was 20 times more productive and, and, and it was sequestering carbon and it was, you know, environmentally rich, it was diverse, you know, it had lots of wildlife in it. So, you know, yes, absolutely. I do firmly believe that we can feed the world using organic principles and, and you know, we can feed 10 or 11 billion people, not just the 7 billion we have at the moment. I do really fervently believe that. And, and I'd sometimes when I read all the calls for, uh, uh, high tech farming and high input farming, and this is the only way you're going to feed the world. I just really do wonder 
whether the people who are writing those reports and who are funding, whether they've ever actually been to areas of the world where people do really struggle with food security, mm -hmm. certainly in rural areas anyway, because what they're proposing is just irrelevant to the situations. 70% of food is produced globally, is produced by subsistence farmers. Mm -hmm. They can't afford the pesticides. They can't afford the GM seeds. Yeah. You know, yeah. that, you know, I, I, it's, it's, you know, we, this sort of dogma that we can produce, you know, our high tech uh, solutions. I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, technology has no place in farming. I'm absolutely not saying that, you know, we have GPS guided tractors, you know, camera guided hose on the, you know, we will use the, any sort of technology. I hope that within 10 years, we'll have swarm robots in the fields, which will, weed and possibly even do sort of some of the pest control. I am not anti-technology. I just think it, you know, one needs to be um, a bit more humble in its adoption and mindful of unintended consequences. So, so, I'm rambling so, a bit, Marita. Which bit of the questions have I not addressed? So, so, what, <laughs> so, so what you're saying is we can actually combine uh, technology and organic methods um, Absolutely. I do uh, not see them as being inconsistent at all. You uh, know, uh, I, I mean, personally, you know, GM, I am, I'm yet to be convinced that it, of its benefits, but I wouldn't absolutely slam the door shut uh, uh, in it. Well, that sounds, sounds all very reassuring. Yeah. So the, the, the next question, which is slightly related to the first, mm -hmm. uh, is um, uh, Riverford fruit and vegetables are delicious, but financially out of reach for many families. Can organic food be a realistic option for everyone and not just for the well-off middle class in mm. terms of affordability for the consumers? I could answer that from many ways. I would love to know that whether the person had actually gone out and done a study on that because whoever's asked the question, because we have done studies at a time and it's generally assumed um, that our vegetables when you when i present them with a basket of vegetables say what do you think that will cost the price the, the average price that the, the the person being questioned came has been twice what we actually charge for them mm -hmm. so I, I i think it's partly a problem of perception you know that we have been written off as being you know it being just for the wealthy middle classes but i cannot dispute our vegetables are a bit more expensive probably typically 20 to 30 percent, you know, if you're buying from uh, a supermarket. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, they are more expensive. Um, but then, you know, there are all the external costs of modern agriculture and food distribution. That, I, I don't know, who do you think, who do we think is paying, paying for them? Who's clearing up the pesticide pollution in the water, the nitrates mm -hmm. in the water? Who's ultimately addressing the issues of carbon in the atmosphere, we're all gonna to have to pay for it sometimes. So there's so many externalities and, you know, caused by agriculture. I mean, agriculture is probably responsible for certainly 20% of environmental damage. And some people would argue as high as 50%. Mm -hmm. Yet it contributes 0.6 of 1% of GDP in the UK. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we're talking about the cost of food at farm gate, it's almost irrelevant. I mean, I mean, what you probably should consider is when you, um, you know, when you, you, you know, you buy your food in a supermarket or in a restaurant or whatever. Roughly, ten percent of that is going back to the farmer. I mean, every year it gets less. So the problem is not actually what happens the cost at the farm gate, which is almost irrelevant. It's everything that's added to it in terms of middlemen on the way, and. Um, yeah, so anyway, I, I, I think we're sort of really asking the wrong question. I, I, I suppose I would almost say, can we afford not to farm organically? You know, the, the um, George Eustace has just, re just recently allowed the reintroduction of neonicotinoid insecticides, which are unquestionably devastating our wild insect population. You know, uh, and it's just uh, it, for, you know, the gain is absolutely trivial you know it is it will say if it saves you one penny this year and your food bill i will be amazed yeah it is unquestionably devastating uh you know bee populations and you can look at that in economic terms in terms you know what their value as pollinators are i i find that a particularly sad indictment of humanity that that's the only value we can put on a bee 
but if you want to look at it from that point of view, they do have an economic um, value. So I, I just think we're asking the wrong questions and we're allowing yeah. agricultural policy to be guided in the wrong way. The absolutely key issue for agriculture at the moment is the environment, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's pollution, uh, or, you know, with pesticides and nitrates, or whether it is access, or sorry, or whether it is, uh, you know, carbon emissions to the uh, atmosphere, which again, arguably somewhere between 15 and 20% of carbon is a result of farming for such a small part of the economy is, is pretty um, shocking. I don't know, I hope I've answered that question. Maria. Yeah, you have. And I, I would certainly agree with what you're saying. And I think also, I think all of us will have to actually give some priority to food. Uh, I think we're spending less now uh, than we used to yeah. uh, in percentage of all our expenditure. And I think, you know, food well, is the most important yeah, thing. It drives me nuts. Why, why do we always talk about, you know, poor people yeah. and how they can afford food? Why yeah, don't yeah. we talk about how can they afford their house? which is yes. typically 50% yeah. of their, of their yeah. disposable income. Why aren't we talking about that? Why do we talk about food? I know. You know, I, know. It's, um, it, it, I, I don't know. It's just like it's become a sort of, mm. it, it's really quite moronic, actually, that, yes. that we put so much focus on. I, you know, I, the, the, issue, the issue with poverty is housing. You know, let's yeah. talk about that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. No, no, it is absolutely the case. And uh, but but because it's asked so often, it, I I felt I ought to ask. Yeah, no, it is. You, it, it, <laughs> and uh, I agree entirely with with your response. I think it's very important, you know, to 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 consume good quality food, both in terms of nutrition, uh, but also in terms of the planet. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't think there's anything more important that we can spend our money on. Um, yeah. Apart in from in terms of nutrients, particularly phyton, you know, the nutrients are protecting us safe from cancer, you probably are paying less per gram of you know, antioxidant buying organic vegetables than you are buying conventional, actually. Mm -hmm. that, that is, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that they are, they are, there is some good evidence of them being uh, nutritionally superior. And I don't think yeah. the experiments have really been done to truly demonstrate the uh, nutritional superiority of certainly um, Riverford vegetables. I would say, I do draw a bit of a distinction between a Riverford vegetable grown in a balanced farming system on a, a balanced soil, as opposed to one bought from a supermarket that has grown yes. on a peat in, the, in, in, the, in the Lincolnshire. I think they are quite different things, even if they are organic, but I'm sure people will think I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you for that. That's, that's, that's great. Um, now, some other questions. Um, what effect is climate change having on your farms? Uh, hot, dry summers and heavy downpours? Uh, yeah. in the I think we all need to be where, you know, a little bit wary about what we call climate change and what we call weather. Um, uh, and, you know, I think really we should listen to meteorologists and statistical analysis to really try and uh, discern that. I think I would really be a bit skeptical about anyone uh, using their personal experience. But having said that, I will, um, you know, my observation over my lifetime is that I wouldn't, I, you know, winters are getting milder, but the most, the, 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 the occurrence of extreme weather events is getting more common. I mean, one shouldn't, but my father always used to remind me about the winter of 47, there was the uh, the, the summer of 76, you know, the, these things have been, you know, we the, the extraordinary things happen, but I, you know, generally we are getting more, you know, you know, long or intense periods of rain or just long periods of continuous rain. I mean, my memory from even, you know, when I started growing vegetables is that, you know, I always used to track the depressions coming across the Atlantic, partly because I love sailing and surfing as well as growing vegetables. And, um, uh, you know, what they used to just roll off and, and in a reasonably, you know, two or three a week in the winter and one a week in the summer was pretty, you know, now, you know, they, they just come one every day and, and, then, and then you'll get three months or four months where you don't get any, you know, that the, the, the um, the the behaviour of the jet stream across the, which brings those depressions weather systems across the Atlantic has, has undoubtedly changed. The it's making longer, slower, 
um, uh, fluctuations, and that's definitely changing our weather. And the most difficult thing, how, how, how that affects us, is that you know we build um, you know all farming practices based on years of experience of the weather, and you know when to sow, what to sow, when to expect to harvest, when to plow in order to be ready to sow, and so on, and you know all those experiences and. And there's always uncertainties, but the uncertainties are getting greater. And, and um, you know, we can adapt to almost anything apart from uncertainty. I would say that is the hardest thing as farmers and, and probably as citizens, you know, is, is the, just the uncertainty, you know, in all sorts of ways at the moment. But yes, it is making life difficult. We are, um, I mean, interestingly, though it has the, you might say, it's undoubtedly got warmer, springs have come earlier, you'd think that that would enable us to grow over a longer season. Uh, in reality, we have actually retreated from what we call the shoulders of the season, so the spring and the autumn, because the risks of extreme weather events are so high that we were just getting too many crop losses. So we were putting a tremendous amount of work and money into crops, which we weren't able to harvest. And so we have got more cautious in our cropping, actually. I think as time goes on, um, with us leaving Europe and uh, climate change and difficulties with importing and so on, I think we will end up putting up more polytunnels and bringing more cropping inside as a way of extending our seasons, but also retaining the sort of control, which, you know, which is so important, you know, with less predictable weather. I mean, I am, I've just spent the last month planting out 20 acres of walnuts and hazelnuts, which come from their varieties which come from the south of France largely. I mean, uh, a local permaculture expert, Martin Crawford, he thinks that the trees that we plant should be really be coming from the Pyrenees now. You know, that we're more, his belief is that we're more or less locked into a two degree temperature rise. And that will be enough to see off most of our oaks, I'm afraid. You know, that's his belief, um, which is, you know, absolutely tragic already seeing the ash, you know, haven't seen elm go and now chestnuts threatened. Um, you know, it's uh, anyway, I, I do think we should be planting, you know, particularly the long term tree crops. We're being mindful of, you know, the likely changes in our in our climate. So um, I suppose one of the big changes we're making is these extreme rainfall events. We have suffered. Uh, some soil loss, which you know, we, we do a lot to try and make sure, you know, to avoid the soil less, but loss, but we are growing on quite steep slopes sometimes. Mm -hmm. We are in quite a high rainfall area. You know, sometimes I wonder whether we should be growing vegetables on those fields at all. And in fact, some of them we have taken out of cultivation, but we will be, you know, we changed our practices in all sorts of ways to um, reduce the length of the runoff, to put in retaining banks, to do what we can to increase the percolation rates through the soil we are you know having to do a lot there and and and, and still last year we did suffer um when was it? it was back just before christmas we suffered the worst soil loss incident i have seen in my life and it was i just felt like my guts were being torn out it was just um uh and that field we will never plow again i mean that's it it's just the risks are just too high uh yeah, so, you know, yes, the weather is affecting our farming practice. I hope I answered the question. You have. So the next one is, are your farms monoculture or diverse production? Um, well, they're certainly more diverse than any of our neighbours. I mean, we do, um, you know, the, the, the range of crop, we grow probably 100 different vegetable crops, you know, in addition to the grasses and the grasses, we don't grow monocultures of rye grass. They are very um, diverse mixtures. Um, you know, increasingly we're trying to manage our hedgerows and the field margins to get as much diversity as possible. Yeah, the key to ecological stability and health is diversity. There's no, we have almost, you know, we have almost no aphid problems in our fields and that's happened over the years. We have less and less, you know, because we have that diversity, because we have lots of flowering plants in the hedgerows and in the field borders, we have um, lots of lace wings and hoverfly adults that feed on those. They lay their eggs in the crops, the eggs, you know, they hatch out and they eat the aphids. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so that is, and that is really, that's not just theory, that is practice. It really, really works. We used to spray our crops with soap a lot 25 years ago. We almost never, outside of the polytunnels, I think we never spray them with any sort of um, for insect control now. So, um, yeah, no, it, it, I would, I would, you know, our farm is tremendously diverse and uh, and getting more so by the year. Yeah. 
Excellent. So next question is, what do you do with wonky vegetables? Do they go in the boxes or do you discard them? Um, and use them well, I think our, our um, specifications, I mean, we do have specifications with our growers and um, occasionally I'm normally the one that's arguing that we should throw less away. But, you know, there's no point in packing and distributing, bearing in mind, if you can remember those carbon impact graphs, you know, most of it is post field gate. There's no point in distributing stuff that people aren't going to eat. Um, so, you know, we have to meet customers' expectations sort of up to a point. I mean, we will do what we can to, you know, so potatoes are, have levels of potato scab on them. We will still sell them I in a supermarket. If you've got one bit of scab on a potato, that's it. They'll condemn the whole lot. You know, we'll sell lettuces with aphids in them and, you know, regularly you can expect to find a slug or two in them. And, you know, that's and that's fine with most of our customers. So wonky carrots. Yes, up to a point. Um, but there, I'm not saying that we, you know, we won't. Yeah, I argue constantly with my wife about this. <laughs> we throw too much away. But it doesn't get thrown away. I mean, the best thing if you can just leave it in the field in the first place, if it comes in and it gets graded out, then we have a kind of hierarchy. It, the staff gets to take home anything they want. You know, we cook it for the lunches for staff. We cook it for the lunches for the local school. We cook it, uh, you know, we have a restaurant on the farm. Uh, beyond that, um, we have a number of local charities who come and pick up. You know, we are cooking actually several hundred meals a week at the moment for poor families locally because our restaurant's shut and that's what the chefs are doing. Uh, and, and if that doesn't work, then it will get fed to the cows. And there are a few things we can't feed to the cows, leeks and onions and a few other things which would taint the milk or are difficult to feed or dangerous or something. And they are composted. So, you know, absolutely nothing is wasted. Um, um, I would guess the amount that leaves the field gate but doesn't get delivered to someone's house is below 2%. Um, and, and, and that even so that, the bottom line is it doesn't get wasted. That's the most no, important thing, no, isn't it? No, it does. You know, the, 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 unfortunately, in a supermarket, it's a very uniform, sterile environment. Your eyes are trained to expect all the courgettes to be the same size i mean i used to grow vegetables for supermarkets i've been in that game and and uh, and their 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 specifications are very very tight and you know it unfortunately the 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 wonky ones are the ones that will get left and will get thrown away i, I do have some sympathy with supermarkets though i do also find them incredibly frustrating to deal with and i do think their specifications are ridiculous i think they take it too far but um and then every now and then they'll have a campaign that they're going to sell wonky veg and they'll make a big sort of marketing thing out of it for a, a few months and then they'll slip back to where they were before <laughs> And, and that has happened so many times in my life. I mean, every time it comes up in the news, I'm like, oh, God, not again. And um, yeah, yeah, no, very little wastage. OK, well, that's good. So what do you import from overseas and how is it transported to your distribution centre? And also the fact you actually do import means clearly that local isn't always necessarily the best because we started in this group thinking yeah. that local was obviously better than yeah. non-local but yeah. we realize quite quickly sometimes it's not um like your tomatoes in the greenhouses or no imported from it's spain for example so yeah, yeah. There, there, there is an argument for growing crops where they are happiest growing you know as you get towards the um it, outside of their sort of climatic zone or their soil preference zone then the chances of crop failure get higher, the yields get lower, and you inevitably end up using more inputs. So for a farmer, that might be, you know, conventional farm insecticides, fungicides, because the crop is less competitive. You know, you do need to protect it more. Uh, you know, and in our case, we don't use any of those, but we might use more fleeces to cover the crop and advance it and so on, protect it from frost. So there are, um, the, yes, there are arguments for, for moving stuff. But the most so when you do import, stream, what sort of transportation do you stream, do? Do you ever air freight anything at all? Or does yeah, it come if, by either lorry or ship? Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Ever, we don't, we don't, nothing's gone on a plane. Um, uh, most from Southern Europe, it will have come in a truck. I mean, very occasionally we get things sent on containers by rail. It's that hasn't really worked very well. Uh, it's not flexible enough, it would seem. Um, but there is uh, that, you know, and and um, we are, um, we do buy quite a lot from Morocco at certain times of year, and we are moving towards that being shipped as well, rather than driven up right through Europe, which is, you know, very carbon intensive, probably be 400 grams of carbon per kilo of, um, of vegetables. So, um, yeah, so, so ship and, and truck would be the, is the, is the answer to that. And it's um, roundabout of our overall emissions, I think getting it, to our pack house amount is around about 20%. When we did it 15 years ago, it was 26% of our carbon footprint. I think it's down, it's less now, um, around about 20%. I think part of the question was, what do we import? Well, we do try and grow what we can within season in the UK, and we are always nudging our customers towards, um, uh, to, towards uh, eating what is in season. So we're just going to start coming into the purple sprouting broccoli season so there will be absolutely per lots of purple sprouting in the from february through to early april and we will be really encouraging people and cauliflowers as well are great at that time of year um and and so then we're going let's think so something like asparagus we do you know the uk season runs from april through to mid late june uh we do have a grower in Spain, uh, just south of Granada, who supplies us with lovely asparagus from February to the start of the English season. Uh, we, 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 we don't sell asparagus outside that season, so we don't sell Peruvian, which is, would always have come in an, on an aeroplane or something. So, you know, I guess we could put more pressure on our customers to eat seasonally. We could reduce their choice more, and that would reduce our carbon footprint. And I think in order to get to net zero, I, I, I do think that we need to do that actually. So I think there is this argument, do you give the customer the choice? So the supermarket model is you go into a supermarket and buy whatever you want. If you don't want to grow, buy UK stuff. Hopefully it's clearly labeled, it's not always, but and, and uh, you can buy all UK stuff. But, it, um, but then you don't know whether it's come out of a heated greenhouse. So it may not be, you know, if you want tomatoes in the winter, you're better off buying Spanish ones. By maybe, maybe there is an argument for doing it, but very, very, very gradually, because then people can get used to it slowly. Because if you do it too, too quickly, people might just say, oh, I'll get this at Sainsbury's or do you know what I mean? They'll go off to the supermarket and buy it instead. Whereas yeah. if you introduce it in a very gradual way and, you know, in your newsletters that you provide as well, you know, you explain why and people might then take to the yeah. idea and, 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 and uh, yeah. think it's I a think good that, I, That's, you know, sensible advice. I think we have... Um, we are more formally sort of measuring things now. I, I've always kind of resisted the idea that, you know, measuring everything and, you know, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So the mantra goes, but it is anyway. And, and, and setting ourselves targets of, of how much we will reduce the emissions associated with importing. And, and I think that's a good way to go. And it gives our buying team a set of rules to work with. And, and, you know, so to set a, an incremental reduction, I think, you know, it was, you know, so we, we have, and the other thing is that we do work with our growers, you know, most of those growers in Spain, we've been working with for 10 or often 20 years. I'm not going to just turn around and tell them we're not buying your stuff anymore. I mean, when we decided we weren't going to buy from heated glass, we gave the growers, we said, we gave them three years, you know, to, to adjust to that change, because I just didn't think it was fair. Well, it's also part of your growers. ethical model, isn't it? Yeah. To look after your growers. Yeah. And so I, I think we will, um, around the periphery, reduce our imports and some of the things uh, that, that, you know, we have already identified that we really don't think our customers would miss very much. You know, avocados are becoming the contentious thing now. Everyone has to have avocados <laughs> 12 Where months of the year. Um, at the moment, they're coming from, I think I'm right in saying we're in the Spanish season at the moment, and they are really beautiful as avocados that come from the Andalusia along the coastal strip there. They're just about 
managed to grow them and they are beautiful. And the rest of the time they're coming from Mexico. As a matter of fact, the Mexican ones, because they've come by ship, don't have a, a much higher carbon footprint than the Spanish ones, which I was quite surprised by. But we won't go further than that. And I, I really don't think, you know, avocados are, anyway, I don't know. I'm never gonna live without a lemon. I'm never gonna live without an onion or garlic, but I really do think I can live without an avocado. And I hope other people can, that we don't need to be getting them all the time, but yeah. yeah. So now we've left the EU, I mean, how do you foresee um, the future? Uh, do you foresee any problems as a consequence of Brexit in terms of food products or farm labour or anything else? Um, yes, yes and yes. Uh, I, I mean, I probably need to confess that I was a Remainer. I mean, I'm not an absolute diehard Remainer. Um, and, and again, I argue with my wife. You know, was there a vote to rejoin the EU? I'm not sure that I would be voting to join it. Or if we'd never been in it, I wouldn't be voting to join it. But the disruption of leaving, I think, has been extraordinary for businesses. And I don't think we've even started to see the effect of that yet, I'm afraid. Um, you know, there's the... Yeah. But anyway, this isn't a political thing. I'm not going to... I, I, I just wanted to say that that is my background, that I was a Remainer. We were absolutely... There definitely is the potential in terms of fisheries and farming to have a better policy outside the EU. Uh, there is the potential that the, the common agricultural policy was a disgrace. You know, um, uh, sorry, I'll just... Uh, um, there was a, a, a disgrace and we could certainly there's the potential to have a better policy for the UK than we had within um, Europe in all sorts of ways. However, you know, the Europe is, has set a target of reducing pesticides usage by 50% for 25% organic in the next 10 years, I think, you know, we have, we have no targets, you know, the, the um, within 10 days of leaving the EU, George Eustace had reintroduced neonicotinoid insecticides, which are unquestionably a part of the cause of the collapse in bee numbers and uh, natural pollinators, you know, for an absolutely trivial gain to sugar beet growers. I mean, it is really, it's just a shocking, I think, an absolutely shocking decision driven by lobbying from the NFU uh, and the agrochemical companies, probably, but the NFU, I know for a fact, you know, lobbying. They sent out tweets to, to their farmers saying, please write to your MP lobbying for this. Oh, and by the way, and don't tell anyone from the media that you're doing so. Don't share it. I, I really hoped that we'd got beyond that. I mean, that's what the oil companies did for, um, uh, for so many years, you know, publicly trying to be responsible, but actually privately undermining uh, climate science. Uh, anyway, so I don't know, they, um, they've just voted the, the Commons to having promised that our standards on uh, environmental food safety, animal welfare standards would be, would be not reduced. They have just voted that they are not going to undertake that imports will meet the same standards as UK farmers. Um, again, absolutely shocking backtracking. They've just started a, a what looks like a complete whitewashing of uh, genetic um, editing, uh, a consultation paper which put in on a very, I'm afraid, and, and, and after four and a half years of negotiating, agri, you know, talking about what our agricultural policy was going to be post-EU, really, you know, farmers have absolutely nothing to go by. We have the, the idea that it's public money for public goods. Well, I would thoroughly support that as a theory and, and as an, an aim, but how that's actually going to be implemented, we have almost no guidance at all. I'm sorry, I mean, it, it look, just looks like being a total fiasco to me. I, I'm really, what about, I'm, I'm uh, really am bitterly disappointed. What about ELMS, which is now the new... Thing? Yeah, the environmental the... land management schemes. Yes. There is very little guidance about what that's actually gonna, I mean, the problem is how do you measure public good, public money for public good? Well, how do you measure the public good? Are you gonna go around counting the bees? Mm. Are you going to measure the carbon in the soil? Are you going to count the butterflies? Are you going to somehow, uh, you know, put some value on the aesthetic, you know, what the countryside looks like? I mean, I thought, I thought, you know, those questions were obvious from the start, and I see no answers to them. Mm. You know, they're they're, it's, um, I can tell you, all the indication is that there's going to be um, 
possibly zero support for our organic agriculture. That's what I'm hearing from people who are close to the decision making. Um, probably one of the only countries in the world, actually. Uh, you know, our, we have a government which is absolutely beholden to the market economy, from what I can see, that the market will provide the solution. So I think, you know, just reading around the sort of periphery, uh, you know, it looks like there's a good deal of enthusiasm for high tech solutions. Well, they may have their place. You know, vertical farming may have its, you know, very, you know, growing perhaps herbs or something. It's not going to be a large part of agriculture and and uh, um, and again you know some you know very targeted use of pesticide and fertilizers may help it's not going to make a massive difference gene editing may make some contribution it won't be huge it won't be you know it's not you know addressing you know the and then we've got people talking about agroecology without really I don't think a lot of people really understand what is meant by the term or they don't agree what's meant by the term so it just seems like a bit of a mess to me i'm sorry i am i'm pretty yeah. pessimistic at the moment i had yeah. i had hoped you know when michael gove was making you know the right early on was making the right sort of noises he really seemed to understand the environmental agenda mm -hmm. but i don't know he actually delivered zero you know mm -hmm. he did a, he delivered a policy document well what good is that to anyone you know, that was four and a half years. You know, you've got to come beyond the policy to how it's going to be implemented. And there just seems to be almost nothing. All the people who are negotiating are sworn to secrecy, so they can't tell us anyway. Um, you know, it's, um, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I really am, uh, uh, really, I, I'm very frustrated, actually. Having gone from being quite optimistic, I'm now pretty frustrated. I mean, you know, we're busy, as I say, planting um, a lot of trees on the farm, walnuts and 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 uh, hazelnuts. I mean, I stood something which is unquestionably environmentally beneficial. I actually stood not only the cost of establishing the trees and everything, thousands of pounds. You know, I actually stood to lose the payment. You know, the common uh, the uh, single farm payment on that land as well. They have actually there has been an announcement that they won't be doing that, but there's still it hasn't been finalised. Um, anyway, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very frustrated. You asked about Labour. I, I have mixed feelings about the Labour thing. I, I um, yes, we about a third of our staff are East European. Most of them have been here for many, many years and have the right to remain, and that won't be a problem. Um, you know, when we need more staff or they do retire, leave, whatever, you know, will we be get, able to get other ones? Will English people want to work on the land? I mean, last year we were tremendously successful at getting UK nationals to have apply for the jobs. I mean, partly it might be having a good reputation as an employer, being employee owned, paying a bit more than other people, but it is going to be difficult. I mean, most, most of your vegetables are untouched by English speaking hands. You won't, you go into a vegetable field or even a vegetable pack house in the UK, you won't, you'll barely hear a word of English spoken. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is the reality of it. And that, so most of those veg producers, which is very labor intensive, are very, very worried about the labor situation. I'm less worried. And I have a, I'm, because I think we can employ, because, you know, we're better at employing people than most farmers, uh, and that they will stay for longer and, you know, we'll be better at recruiting good people. And all the signs are is it's much more difficult to employ UK people and to motivate them. And no doubt some of them are unfamiliar with, you know, a hard day's work and so on. But when I hear people criticising them for being unfamiliar, including farmers, I just say, well, when was the last time you went out in a field and actually spent eight hours pulling up leeks, you know, for nine pounds an hour, you know, and, um, you know, and got treated like serfs for doing it. I'm sorry, I think a lot of farmers are absolutely appalling employers mm -hmm. and, and they need to, you know, get with the 21st century. You know, we're not living in Victorian, you know, Britain anymore and that they need to be better employers and thereby attract more people. And then obviously it would help if we, you know, could pay people more and that would involve charging more for food. So I have mixed feelings about the, I mean, I think Brexit happened because of immigration uh, and driving down the um, pay at the lower end. And I have a good deal of sympathy for people who voted for Brexit, who were, you know, living on minimum wage or, or not much more. They would be much, much better off now if we hadn't had so many East Europeans here. Not that I've got anything against East Europeans, obviously, you know, but it is, um, I think that is the truth. It's, Sorry. We're coming towards the end of the session, but yeah. can I ask you 
just a couple of other questions, which are, um, you know, one of them is, uh, can your boxes be reused now or has COVID mm. affected the reuse? No, I mean, the evidence, we do look at this, you know, periodically as it's got worse, but I think there's very little evidence that, of the, from, um, you know, that it can be caught from surfaces that mm. have been, you know, untouched for a matter of days. So the cycle of them being used, coming back, being sorted and being reused would be typically three weeks. I, I, I think the risks associated with that are close to mm. zero. So yeah. Um, yeah. no, we are still reusing them. Mm, that's good. Uh, and can you explain what being B Corp means? Okay. Um, B Corp, quite an interesting American import, and it is a, um, it's a sort of certification, you get evaluated, you have to fill in a questionnaire, and then you get questions on the questionnaire, and they will send someone to evaluate it, and they will assess your contribution, not just to shareholder value, which of course is, you know, what most boards of directors, you know, are obsessively worrying about, keeping their shareholders happy, it, the, the, your, your environmental impact, your social impact, impact on the community, uh, your, you, you know, whether you're a good employer, um, I think that would cover most of it. So it's kind of like a triple or even quadruple sort of bottom line as people, so it's not, and, and then you have to change, legally, you have to change your company articles such, basically most corporate law, it, it's, almost illegal actually until it changed in about 2006 but it, to do anything that was not in the interest of shareholders as a director you, you're virtually breaking the law I mean this is the influence of Milton Friedman who has really guided western economics since I don't know the 50s I suppose you know Margaret Thatcher was a big fan of him and Reagan and you know actually even Tony Blair was and whatever you know that the idea that if you looked after the shareholder, everyone else would be fine. I, I think finally that has been questioned, and as a, and and I would say the B Corp is a result of that. So we we um I'm I'm not an absolute enthusiast of it. I mean I do I do I, well I so I just do think um. I think it's definitely better than what was than not having it. And we, we, we went through the certification procedure and came in with a, um, I think we're certainly the highest UK food. Um, our score was 120, um, which was, you know, really pretty extraordinary. Um, and, uh, and I do think, I think it's of less relevance to us. We view it as a, may, as a kind of audit of, are we doing all the things that we should be doing? Are there things that we haven't thought about? How can you measure them? And how can you set targets for management teams, you know, to improve their performance? And, and that's how we're using it internally. We, do, we actually don't shout about it a lot because I view it as a more of an internal tool than an external sort of to facilitate bragging rights sort of thing. Um, but I do, I, th I do think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a complete solution to the problems of capitalism, just like I don't think fair trade is a total solution to, you know, making sure that banana and coffee and cocoa producers are looked after properly. Uh, but I think it's a good stepping stone in that direction. Right. Yeah. Can I also ask you, do you work together with Exeter University? We do quite a bit, yeah. And, yeah. and is that how you get your measurements, uh, you know, like the carbon emissions and so forth? Or do you um, get... We did on our first, when we did it first in 2006, seven, we worked with Exeter University and they were very good. Um, it was a knowledge transfer partnership. We are, we're doing some projects with them now and again, some with Plymouth University on environmental things, but we're mainly using a, uh, a kind of, um, I'm not sure whether they're a not-for-profit, but anyway, it's an environmental consultancy. I think you have to have some external evaluator. You can't be just marking your own homework all the time. Uh, you need to be someone asking you the difficult questions and making so we, we, but we've used this, um, this consultancy, uh, God, I can't even remember what they're called, Clear View or something, I think they are, that, to do our most recent one. Um, but they are following all the same methodology that an academic institution would. So we're coming to the end of our time, really. It's been really interesting to talk to you. Now, just to finish off, if you could give us 
some inspiration, some advice. We want to, this is part of the group, we want to become better consumers in whatever way we can um, regarding food um, and in other ways, obviously. But if you were to give basic advice to someone who were starting out on this, who hadn't already thought, what, what would be the most important and achievable things that everyone can do? Because everybody says, oh, but I can only do so much, that's not enough, and so on. But, you know, um, what would you tell them? What would be your encouraging advice to people to embark on being sustainable consumers? Um, I will um, make a lot of people, by neighbouring farmers, unhappy saying this, but I would say the one thing that you can do that is within your own control is to eat less meat, dairy and eggs. Um, you know, their, their environmental impact is huge. And, and, you know, there are definitely, there's definitely some meat that's less damaging than others. You know, and if it's truly pasture fed beef and dairy, and lamb, you know, there's, there are good arguments for that. However, you know, when you go into your, you know, butchers or supermarkets, you don't know, you know, they're, they're, you don't, so I think as a consumer, all you can do is eat less of it, really. There's the Pasture Fed Livestock Association, which is, um, and of course, organic is gonna be much more pastoral um, uh, as well. Um, so I would think that is important, I would say, try to eat organic wherever you can and try to eat seasonally you know so um you know eat more cabbages and less peppers you know this time of year i mean savoy cabbages like you know they're just i know people just you know they start thinking about school dinners but i mean savoy cabbages you know spring greens i mean they are just, you know they can be just they're beautiful delicious. i mean yeah, yeah. yeah you know and and just try and not be so you know, hung up on eating tomatoes and peppers and cucumbers and aubergines all year. You know, actually, our UK season without heat is, you know, eight weeks, ten weeks. But it's possibly. an opportunity to be creative in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, no, you know, yeah, yes. So, um, yeah, try and eat what is in season. Um, and of course, a lot of people won't know what's in the season. But <laughs> hopefully, they'll have a some sort of sense of it. Uh, um, and, you know, so lots of leeks, cabbages, cauliflowers at this time of year. I mean, we're all going to want our salads, but, you know, you can make lovely salads out of a cabbage, you know. It doesn't, you don't have to, you know, import a little gem lettuce, you know, all the time. So, um, yeah, I guess those, that would be, um, and I suppose when you, when you really do, there's a tremendous amount of greenwash out there and, and people who are, you know, not being strictly honest. But when you do find a business that you do actually trust and you know you can trust, you know, really try and support them. And especially, you know, a lot of food businesses, non-online food businesses having a really hard time at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be sure that they're going to be there when, um, you know, when COVID and Brexit is over. And uh, yeah, so when you find someone, an honest one, even if they're not perfect, I would put honesty at the top, actually. Yeah. I'd be, yeah, you know, if I, the person I'd buy fish off, you know, I do, when he, I ask him, you know, how is it called? And whether it's a beam trawler, he'll tell me it's a beam trawler. And, and because he tells me that, I tend to sort of believe the other things that he says, you know, so um, there is a tremendous amount of um, deceit, I'm afraid, in the, the food trade. So yeah, when you find someone trustworthy, um, support them. Well, Guy, thank you so very much for joining oh, us. You. It's been a pleasure to uh, to listen to you. And, I'm sorry uh, about the interruptions of the dog and my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, don't worry, you can go and attend to him now. <laughs> anyway, thanks very, very much. And um, yes, thank you. Well, we'll thank be in you. touch. And uh, hopefully this will also be available to the Greater uh, U3A membership at some point. Okay. in terms of the YouTube video. But we'll right. be in touch with you about Great. that and so Great. forth. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.